Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Friday of the month, which means it's time for The Doctor Is In Q&A with Ron Weiss, MD, where we answer your questions. So if you submit in advance, you got a greater chance for them to be answered because the chat moves so quickly when we have Dr. Weiss on. Please welcome him to the show. What, what have you been up to and how are you doing? Hello, everyone. Oh, well, uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff as usual. Uh, ooh, it's a it's a nice and uh, springy here in Long Valley, New Jersey. Um, let's see. The last thing I did is I was uh, very honored to go to Washington D.C., Chef AJ, a few ooh. weeks ago, because uh, the Farm Bill is coming up this year for renewal, and um, the Farm Bill is. Um, I guess it depends how you, you look at it. It's, it's the reason why our food is so messed up in the United States, our food system. It's why we have so much disease and so much um, and so many medical problems. That's the way I look at it. So I was um, fortunate enough to go to Washington and, and, uh, and help um, uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Uh, he's from Oregon, but he's the leading congressman in Congress that has a, a alternate proposal for our farm bill. And guess what? It recommends people eating better and growing more plant foods and foods without chemicals and taking away um, subsidies from uh, production of uh, GMO corn and soybean that create hamburgers and feed CAFO operations and defunding CAFOs, all this stuff. It was very exciting. Wow. Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I was the guest of Gene Bauer. I don't know if you've had him on. Oh, I have. He's wonderful. He's so wonderful. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you. Hey, so anything you want to talk about? Or you want to just hop right into the no, question? No, let's pop right in. Because okay. I know we have well, a lot of know, We never know what they are until we ask them. So we'll do it in the order we've got them. This first one, and always make sure if it's anonymous, say it at the beginning, is... Uh, Okay, this is from Eileen. What about eating oatmeal most mornings if you're pre-diabetic? <laughs> okay, well, I would say that's an excellent idea. Um, so uh, oatmeal has special carbohydrates in it that feed your gut microbiome, which are very advantageous and then helps to reverse your diabetes. And this is such a timely question uh, is it Yvonne or Elaine? Eileen. Eileen, uh, because uh, I remember Dr. Greger did a series of a few videos just like, I think it was last month, on how powerful just eating oatmeal is. And historically, I did not know this, but before there was any treatment for diabetes or insulin or anything like that, in the at, around the turn of the 20th century, they were giving people oatmeal, only oatmeal and nothing else to treat diabetes. And it was um, acknowledged by Jocelyn. Uh, I don't know if you, that name sounds familiar, but the Jocelyn Clinic in Boston was the major diabetes center in the United States, in the world, to treat diabetes. And even uh, he used it. So yes, definitely. Of course, when you eat the oatmeal, you should have it as healthy as possible. And as healthy as possible means as non unprocessed as possible, right? So just remember that when you eat rolled oats, like Quaker oats, um, they have been processed. They've been steamed. They've been cooked a little bit. Then they've been flattened out between rollers. Then they've been cooked again. And that make, gives them a higher glycemic index. What is a glycemic index? Glycemic index is when you eat a food, how quickly will the simple carbohydrates from that food be entering your, in other words, the sugars, be entering your bloodstream. And so foods with a higher high glycemic index means that the sugars enter into your bloodstream faster. You don't want to do that if you have prediabetes or diabetes. You want the sugars to be retained in your intestine and enter very gradually. And so 
when you compare the glycemic end index of rolled oats, like Quaker oats, to steel cut oats or oat growths, it's much different. So uh, I would recommend the whole, the oat growths or the steel cut growths. I think that would be your best bet. And please check out Dr. Gre Greger's videos. If you go into the recent videos, you'll see them, oat oatmeal to treat diabetes. Right. Yeah. Oat groats actually taste really good. I wish people would give them a try. I think they taste much yeah. better than rolled oats and even than steel yeah. cut oats. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very and nutty. Yeah. We grow them here on the farm, by the way. You're kidding. And we'll have a crop of them come June. Wow. Do you sell them? Yes, we do at our farm market. So we are part of, we have our own gra grain cooperative with River Valley Community Grains. Uh, it's um, and we collaborate with them. It's a basically uh, there are three very brave gentlemen who reconstructed a a grain system here in uh, northern New Jersey from all the old places that used to go, grow grain, but everything had been disassembled. And today there are multiple farms in this cooperative in northern New Jersey growing grains, all kinds of heirloom grains. We're to, this year we're grow, growing uh, oats, but all kinds of heirloom wheat and check them out. Uh, River Valley Community Grains. Um, I'm not sure if you can buy stuff from them online, but perhaps you can. Check them out. Definitely people who are in the New York metropolitan area, uh, New Jersey, uh, the, uh, the River Valley Community Grains goes to all the local farm markets. So check out their rep website, River Valley Community Grains. Perfect. Thank you. Here's a question on Billy Rubin from Trisha. Mm -hmm. I've been whole food plant-based for eight years. My blood tests come back normal until recently completed uh, uh, lipids, A1C, flash. Okay. Everything's normal except Billy Rubin is always one point higher than normal when I get blood tests done, which is three times a year. I check my C-reactive protein from having Crohn's. Why is this? Is there something I should further investigate with Billy Rubin levels? I've been in remission for Crohn's from eight, for eight years. And this lady eats a whole food plant-based diet? For eight years. Yep. So you've demonstrated what we know, right? Um, Generally speaking, unknown at, uh, at university GI departments, not known, including Mount Sinai, where Dr. Crone practiced, right? Because I have many patients who go to Mount Sinai because we're in their area, but this is unknown to them. So I congratulate you for bringing this to light. Thank you so much. Um, that whole food plant-based diet is the most powerful way to reverse Crohn's disease. It's been shown that there, even to this day, there's no drug that can throw it into as complete a mission as just eating whole plant foods. Um, so the bilirubin, the bilirubin really has nothing to do with the Crohn's disease. And for those of who are listening, just so you, I, I don't leave you in the dark regarding the commentary on Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is a terrible autoimmune disease, one of the most terrible, where your colon is attacked and it can cause devastating outcomes in your abdomen. Um, uh, and the fact that this young lady reversed, completely reversed this disease, where in university settings, the, the department, the gastroenterology department doesn't really know what to do with it, except give immune crushing high tech drugs is just amazing. It's one of the lights of, of, of uh, lifestyle medicine and whole plant foods. So um, she asked the question about the bilirubin. There's a certain small percentage of the population, maybe it's a, I don't know, three, five percent, something like that, uh, which, uh, and these people and this percentage of the population has have a specific genetic, um, arrangement uh, uh, for their bilirubin metabolism. What is bilirubin? Bilirubin is the pigment uh, that comes from breaking down your red blood cells. Your re red blood cells only last for like 120 days or so. And when they're recycled, the pigment comes from the, the, the bilirubin comes from the pigment that's inside your red blood cells. It goes to the liver. 
your liver processes it to make bile out of it. Bile is a detergent. It's, sque it's made in your liver, collected in your gallbladder. Gallbladder balloon squeezes it out into your intestines through the common bile duct. It's like a little pipe. Every time you eat a fat, every time there's fat, when you eat, it, it, detergents break up fats. Uh, that's why like when you look at a detergent, like if you were to have a grease stain and you put on like a detergent, the detergent breaks up the grease stain and gets it out of your clothes. It's the same kind of thing. So this bilirubin is, is the major component of the detergent. And for some, there are some genetic variants where the liver in these people just, it's not able to conjugate or arrange the bilirubin that efficiently to make the detergent. And so some of it collects at higher levels in the bloodstream than the rest of us. It's fine, don't worry about it. It will never cause you any harm. It, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and you've most likely had it your entire life long uh, and it will never get worse and it's not changing, it's of no harm to you. So, and, and the name of this condition is called Gilbert's disease or syndrome. Uh, Gilbert spelled like Gilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T apostrophe S. If you want to look it up, you'll find that it's very, it's terrible. They call it disease, <laughs> but don't be misled. It's not a disease. It's just like a genetic, how can I say? It's a, it's a, it's a genetic expression that a, a small minority of us have. It won't harm you. Right. But people, I mean, is one point really significant in general in a blood test? No, it's not. However, I must say that other kinds of bilirubin elevations, that can be very, mm, I just don't want people to think that if you have a bilirubin elevation, they're always benign. But it is in this case where someone has a small elevation, it's always there. And it's, it's a very common thing. Great. Thanks. This is from Linda. Dr. Weiss, is there anything I can do for non-diabetic neuropathy? The test results are called sensory neural neuropathy. Can the nerves be healed with diet or supplements and can the nerves regenerate and heal? Hmm. So yes, there are different kinds of peripheral neuropathy. Um, what this young lady is asking about is, um, just to explain peripheral neuropathy for a little background. You know, we have a central nervous system, which consists of the brain and our spinal cord. And from the spinal cord emanate networks of wires or peripheral nerves that carry electrical impulses that allows us to feel, move, uh, balance ourselves. Uh, and so, uh, a peripheral neuropathy is when there is a dysfunction of the conduction of electrical impulses along these wires, the peripheral nerves as they stretch out into your extremities and, you know, towards your skin on your trunk. So um, there are many different causes of, of a peripheral neuropathy um, or dysfunction of the peripheral nerves. Um, the, probably the most well-known and most common one is diabetic neuropathy. The diabetes after many years or maybe not, sometimes not many years causes damage to the nerves and, and they can, that is generally regarded and the evidence shows and my experience shows that that is reversible uh, once you uh, go on a whole food plant-based diet, that if you have peripheral neuropathy, that usually is reversible. Uh, and usually completely, no matter how bad it is, if it's diabetic. However, there are other causes of peripheral neuropathy, and it's not clear to us whether a whole food plant-based diet can reverse that. And sometimes I have had patients with some like small fiber neuropathies, and it hasn't been reversed, even though they ate a whole food plant-based diet. So I would say the first thing to do is to try and find out from the neurologist why you have this sensory neural peripheral neuropathy. Why? Oftentimes, you will get an answer from the neurologist is that it's idiopathic. 
Idiopathic means I don't know why. There's no known underlying cause. And if that's the case, um, I think the best thing I can do, you know, when, when I am stumped with um, using a diet of whole plant foods to help somebody with a medical condition, the next thing I naturally turn to is long-term water fasting. So I think that um, I would encourage you to maybe contact Dr. Goldhammer at the True North Health Center and, and you can write him an email. And I know he, he looks at all this stuff. For those of you who don't know, the, the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California has the largest series of fasting patients in the world. Um, and sometimes amazing things can happen with chronic diseases that we can't even handle with whole plant foods when you fast, but it's, they're selective. So I, I, would, I would try to contact Dr. Goldhammer and bring it to him, ask him his opinion. Thank you. And hopefully we'll get him on the show soon. Mm -hmm. Kathy says, She's followed a sulfur-free diet for six years and a non-junk food vegan diet for 33, but she has constipation. Was wondering, is it possible to eat too much fiber? She gets extensive bloating as the day progresses. She's 63. All imaging showed a redundant bowel, stool in the bowels, but no pathology. She had x-ray, ultrasound, CT, and colonoscopy. GI specialists gave her a clean bill of health. She exercises daily, drinks fluids, doesn't take medication, manages stress, sleeps six to seven hours a night. She was going to try six prunes a day, which was suggested. She has. I'm sure she was going to try what? Six? Six prunes a day, which was suggested by a doctor last week. She has a BM daily and easily fairly well formed, but never seems to fully empty. And she has a squatty potty. Love squatty potties. Okay. Well, can you just go back to the beginning? Did this young lady say she was vegan junk food for how many years? Uh, she said three decades. No, no, no. She wasn't junk food at all. She said clean, really six years. And then before that non-junk food vegan for 13 years, but maybe she had. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let me start off by saying that constipation in, in a patient who is eating a high level of whole plant foods, I find extremely rare, almost so that I can never I can't remember ever seeing a patient, and I've seen hundreds of thousands of patients over my lifetime as a physician. I can't remember encountering a patient who had constipation. So the question is, what is constipation? Constipation is, is, is very common in the uh, average American public who's eating a diet of ultra-processed, and animal foods that do not contain plant fiber. And that's the key. It's a low fiber diet. So um, constipation is defined as difficulty eliminating your stools. And often, and most often it can also be um, combined with the, the, def the aspect of the stool being hard. Um, so, or firm. So, um, usually it's inadequate fiber content that causes this condition. And that's why when someone eats a high level of plant, whole plant foods, I don't ever really remember seeing it uh, continue the constipation it resolves. So, there's so many questions to ask here. I have these questions in my mind. Um, how many grams, of course, we won't get the answer to this, but has this lady ever analyzed actually how many grams of fiber is she eating per day? So the average American, because when I have a medical problem and the problem still persists despite reputed efforts <laughs> that are supposed to work to resolve the problem, I like quantification. I like saying, you know, measuring like, okay, well, what actually are you doing? So in this case, the first thing I would do is saying, how many grams of fiber are you eating today? The average American who's constipated has, I think, 15, one, five grams of fiber, which is almost nothing. Our paleolithic ancestors, 
uh, and we know this from analyzing stool fossils in caves at, at archaeological sites, eight, sometimes a hundred grams a day. Um, you and I, uh, Chef AJ, you know, eating like a, a high level of plant-based foods, maybe we eat 40 to 60 grams of fiber per day. So the first thing I would say is increase your fiber so that you eat probably closer to 60 grams of fiber a day, 50 to 60 grams of fiber, if you're not already doing that. If you are already doing that, um, uh, the second thing I would consider is, um, you, know, um, I, you know, we don't have all the information, but it sounds like you, you intimated that you have a problem or you feel like you don't evacuate completely when you're on the bathroom, but in, on the toilet, it seems like you're in the right position. And by the way, this, uh, the squatty potty you mentioned for all the audience members listening, Chef AJ, a squatty potty is a sort, a sort, a sort of aid that makes you sit forward while you're evacuating your bowels because that positions the colon and rectum in the right position to allow the stool to come down. If you just sit it, at, at a perpendicular angle at 90 degrees, the colon and rectum is very tortuous or curvy and, and it's not a direct shot into the toilet. So for those of you who have problems, if you lean forward, if you've ever seen that, um, the Rodin sculpture, the thinker, you know, in, in Paris, like this, you have to take that position. You don't necessarily need a squatty body, but if you just lean forward and hinged at your pelvis, that will help to open up that rectal angle so that you can evacuate more school, stool. This young lady seems to be doing that because she, she understands. Um, I might still, if you haven't done so, consult the services of a colorectal surgeon. Uh, colorectal, not that I would do operations on you, but they're the experts in stool evacuation. Sometimes they may find that, you know, I don't know, you may have weak muscles down there. Uh, that, that, and maybe that's why you can't fully evacuate. If that were the case, um, I don't know, perhaps pelvic floor therapy would help you. There are other things that could maybe help you if the colorectal surgeon found that you had issues. Um, if not, if they can't find a problem, uh, an, another just reassurance is, I know Chef AJ, this young lady has, has said that when she had the x-rays, it showed that her colon was fill, filled with stool. Guess what I found from our, all of our whole food plant-based eaters? Every time, one of our patients goes to the ER. They love doing CAT scans in the emergency room. And I, I would encourage, I know sometimes you have to do a CAT scan because you have no choice or you must, but try to avoid CAT scans because they have huge amounts of radiation, which increase your lifetime chance of getting cancer. Every one you get. Okay, if you need to get one, fine, but I, I don't like this idea where every time we go to emergency rooms, we're constantly getting radiated with CAT scans. And so whenever, unfortunately, some of my patients go to the emergency room, they'll get a CAT scan. Probably once or twice a year, they'll get an abdominal CAT scan. And we always get the radiologist reading. It always says this patient is constipated. And the patient is not, they have no symptoms of constipation. What's going on is, we eat such huge amounts of fiber that it gives huge amounts of stool that are loading the entire six feet tube of the colon. And because the, and because the radiologist is so rarely sees anyone who eats 40 to 60 grams of fiber, the radiologist thinks it's constipation, that we're not moving our bowels, but it's not. It's just a lot of fiber. So don't worry about what that says on the x-ray that you had constipation. It's, it's not a functional test. 
Uh, it doesn't really tell you who you are, what you are. Last thing I will say, I know this is going on too long, but you wanted an answer. Some of these are excellent questions because it really, I can tell you a very high level patience. They've, they've really gone like to the nth degree. Uh, these are tough, tough questions you're asking me. I was taught in medical school that there are some people who they're born without enough nerve endings in their colon to move the stool along with peristaltic movements. I personally don't really believe that anymore, but I guess if that's always a possibility, I think it would be highly unusual and rare, but I would encourage you, uh, ma'am, to, to, if you haven't already done so, to follow up on these other suggestions I've made to you to see if you can solve your problem. Great. So there's really no such thing as too much fiber then, huh? Uh, no. You know, there's there's sort of dangerous kinds of things you could do to get fiber. Uh, like, for example, you could eat like a pound of uh, sunflower seeds that are unshelled, and it could end up turning into a bezoar or like a ball of matted, undigestible fiber in your intestine or stomach or colon somewhere. But unless you're doing something like that, no. As long as you're eating a diverse and a, a lot of uh, diverse plant-based diet, no. I, Chef AJ, I don't, did you ever try to measure how much fiber you have a day? How many? Oh my grams? God, it's so much. It's ridiculous. But it would be oh. interesting. Maybe I can I can I challenge you the next time we meet. Yeah. Could we? Could you tell? Could you do like a week's average measure? I'm just interesting, and maybe I'll do the same thing, and we can tell our guests how many grams of fiber we eat because remember the cave people the paleolithic people they were we know that they were eating 100 grams and oftentimes uh very uh traditionally living people like in around the equator like in africa they can eat quantities like that too so um it would be interesting to see. I, I know I at least, I calculated it once. I know I at least eat 40 grams of fiber. Do you use chronometer to calculate yours or some other? No, I just, I just added it up by hand. Okay. So I'll tell you what, I have a question here. And depending on how long you take, I can at least calculate because I remember what I ate yesterday and see if I can come up with something today. Okay. Okay. So this question is for J from Jane. Hi, Dr. Weiss. I was recently diagnosed with osteopenia. My doctor recommended that I try to gain a little weight and increase my soy consumption. I'm 59, 5'4", four, four, and 105 pounds. I've increased my nut and seed consumption, added in a tablespoon of nut butter each day, and started eating tofu four to five times per week. My LDL cholesterol, which tends to be high despite a highly compliant whole foods SOS free diet, went from 105 to 120. Could the nut seeds and tofu have caused the increase? Any suggestions for lowering my LDL? I've tried every tip and trick, and I've heard on Chef AJ show that I have never been able to get it to below 100. Total cholesterol is 185. Thank you, Jane. Okay, and herein lies the conflict. So, what this young lady just talked about, I have found to be very true in almost every single patient who starts to eat nuts. The LDL goes up. And, and I believe this is one of the reasons why Dr. Esselstyn doesn't recommend. Um, you know, I, I understand, I have had that experience in all of our patients that the, the on average, when we, because we move our patients through various uh, styles and ways of eating, and we start them off eating uh, in a no, in a very, when they join our programs in a, a, a they, eat, they eat some seeds, like uh, always eat flax seeds and chia seeds, but we spare the nuts. And then we tend to add the nuts later on. And I've always seen, it's, it's, it's just amazing. The LDL and the average rise from no nuts to nuts is about 15 to 20 points, just like this lady, just, uh, just like she explained to us. So uh, I believe that you are right. I think that your, your LDL probably went up unless there are other things you change that we don't know about or you're unaware of. I think it is likely to be because of the nut consumption. Um, 
Um, you have to remember that soybeans, although they're very good, they do have fat in them, probably a lot of more fat than other kinds of beans. So um, generally speaking, when you're eating fat, uh, your LDL will go up, right? And you're not eating fat and your LDL will go down. So that's the story with that. Now, the question is, is that bad for you? Aha. What do you think, Chef AJ? Just because your LDL goes up, is that bad? I, I'm going to say it's probably not in her case. If, I, if, if she's really following the diet, then maybe not worrying about the numbers. But again, I'm not a doctor. So that's the big conflict. Does that is that meaningful? Is that a is that a threat to you just because the LDL goes up? Quite frankly, you want my and this is very controversial. See, I, I know Dr. Esselstyn probably doesn't like it because you, you know I, you see it going up, but I think that um, you know I think that um, as long as you can as long as it's not very high and as long as you don't have present a coronary disease or cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic disease that's known. And as long as you have low in, inflammatory state, which can be measured by blood tests, and we know there's not uh, active inflammation in you that drives cardiovascular disease, I'm okay with that. Uh, I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, and what I would do is I would try to concentrate on building your bones. Because at the end of the day, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, the data shows that, and if you don't have heart disease now, it would be very rare that you would ever get a, car, a heart attack or stroke, or if, if possible, from what we know. So, however, if, you, if your bones continue to degrade, I think your chance of getting a fracture is higher. So I would try and focus on that. Just but a word about the bones. Um, you should make sure you're getting at least minimum 60 grams of protein a day. And that's why I like you eating those beans because they're champions of protein. Minimum 60 grams a day to build your bones. And you can get that by eating a lot of legumes like you're doing. Uh, legumes also have all that calcium in them, which, which will help your bones. Dark leafy greens like kale has four grams of protein per cup. A lot of, a lot of protein, a lot of calcium. Those greens have calcium. Collards have a lot of calcium. So eat your dark leafy greens, eat the legumes, get your protein, um, do loading exercises. Um, loading exercises, and that's a whole different subject if you ever want to get back to that, Chef AJ, but do loading exercises that will increase your bone mass. Make sure that your, your vitamin D, I would say, is at least in the 40s or 50s, and then I would repeat the bone density test in a year to see if you were successful. One last thing. Regarding the loading exercises, Chef AJ, I tell people it has to be a job to them. It's not like you're just doing some recreational exercise. You really have to focus on it every single day for a couple of hours. And if you do that, I think you will rebuild your bones and reverse your osteopenia. Well, you know, it brings to me a question about Oh, Dr. McDougall always talks about the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Because I know with me, the minute I put any fat in my diet, a little tahini, a little nuts, my weight will go up like immediately three to five pounds. But are there ways to gain weight other than fat? Yes, muscle. You want to gain, the, the doctor doesn't want you, no one wants you to gain fat. That's just not useful. He wants you to gain weight by gaining muscle mass. And the reason why that's important is what do you think moves the bones in your skeletons? It's muscles. So by gaining, by increasing the size of your muscles, that the muscles are attached to your skeleton. When, if there's a greater muscle mass, there's a greater pull on the anchor into your bone. It's that greater force from the pulling that will catalyze the rebuilding of your bone. So you want larger muscles. Do that by eating, that's why I told you to get that protein. 
Um, people who, I've seen this in my practice, people who are protein deficient, let me tell you something. Where do you get your protein from, Chef AJ? I get it from everything I eat. Where, I, I don't know, where do you get protein? From the food. So that's an old joke, right? No, I know. Everyone, I get it from everyone the- asks people, where do you get your protein from? But you know what? It's not such a silly question because I've noticed that a lot of our patients who eat plants are protein deficient. They are. As you get older, you need, because they're not eating enough plants. That's why. It's not that plants don't have them, but you're not, oh, many people are not, especially women with osteoporosis or osteopenia or sarcopenia, which means shrinking muscles. They're not getting enough combinations of the right plant foods in order to get the protein. So you got to really pay attention to that. Bones and muscles are made out of protein. Great. Thanks. Uh, while you were talking, I calculated yesterday's fiber. I eat two meals a day, 70 grams. 70. Yeah. And it's just from fruits and be- it's from fruits yeah. and be- I don't eat any beans. It was just, you know, uh, grains sweet potatoes, vegetables, and fruit. Well, you know what? The amazing thing is, and I just want to make people realize this. I know, see all those starches you were eating? Uh, You know, people think that like kale has a lot of, I know it's very rough looking, like kale and broccoli, and it does have fiber, but the fleshy vegetables are mostly water. Water is not fiber. You know, it has as a, a component of their mass, it's the dry plant foods like the legumes and the grains that have the most fiber per weight. So I like that figure that you gave that even though you ate just two meals, you were able to get 70 grams of fiber. Remember I said 40 to 60, excellent. Thank you. And that's how you get a good gut microbiome, right? You've had Will Busevich on, right? Yep. Fiber fuel. You are fiber fuel. Yeah. And fiber Maybe fuel. right back to that lady who wrote you. I'd be curious if she ever wants to just find out. To, to have, ask her, do, even on a chronometer, whatever she wants to use, do the calculation. She may find out she's only eating 40 fibers, 40 grams. Uh, maybe you could give her that, give her that menu plan that you ate yesterday, have her do it, eat twice a day for seven days and see if her constipation goes away. That's funny. I eat the same thing every day, honey, yams and broccoli. Yeah. That that right there was, uh, you know, 33. 33 was just for lunch, so. Yeah, halfway. Yep. Nice. All right, this is from Michael. Are there any vegan nephrologists or anyone who can help someone getting off dialysis? Um, he says X type two, I'm guessing maybe X type two diabetic. So what Michael is talking about is, um, you know, if you were to go into a dialysis ward, Chef AJ, and let's say there are 10 people getting dialyzed, nine of them are there because of diabetes. Their kidneys failed because of diabetes. One or two of them is there because of hypertension. Or, you know, there's someone else there because they had a congenital disease or like an autoimmune disease, something like that. But the eight, like, let's say 80% of them are there for diabetes. So the great, one of the greatest fears of diabetes is that it destroys your kidneys. Um, So the first thing you'd ask is, uh, you know, if you intervene early enough, as your kidney function is declining with diabetes, you can stop the decline. I've noticed in all of our patients, so they don't go on to dialysis. What happens once you've gone so low where you need to be dialyzed, where your kidneys stop functioning? Well, um, do you know Dr. Steve Luenda? Of course, we were buds when we lived in LA. Good friends, actually. He's such a beautiful man. He has a a case that I've seen, because he does a slideshow on this, of a lady who had type 2 diabetes who was in 
on dialysis who got off dialysis by eating a whole food plant-based diet and nothing else. Now that is unusual. I personally have not seen that before, but he took care of a patient like that. So um, I think that it is possible. Um, if this gentleman lives in California, he can contact Dr. Steve Luenda um, because he knows about it. I think he works for Kaiser. Yeah, um, Kaiser in, in yeah, Southern California. In LA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would basically advise you to eat a diet of whole plant foods. And you could do it yourself if you're not. A, the gentleman doesn't say if, if he's afflicted or a relative or friend. He doesn't say. He doesn't. So I'm guessing just I'm eat a diet of whole plant foods and see, um, you know, if you if if you're um, basically if it's going to work and help you, it will. And if it doesn't, uh, you need a kidney transplant. Mm. That's it. And then here's the thing about it. Whether it works or not, I would still do it. Why, Chef AJ? Even if even I, if I told you, you know what? It's hopeless for you. Uh, your kidney shot, it's completely dead. It can't be brought back. Why, why should they eat a whole food plant-based diet? Because I'm assuming there may be a hope to get a kidney transplant, right? And if you get that kidney transplant, you want to preserve that kidney function. You want to do that by eating whole food plant-based. So when you get the new kidney, it will be healthy and you'll maintain it. So that's my advice. And also, of course, even if you're on dialysis, eating a whole food plant-based diet does many things. Most dialysis patients, the threat of them, you know, their blood is being cleaned out, but the great threat to their life is infection, uh, cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes, and plant-based whole foods diets are champions at, at, uh, at preventing those kinds of things from happening. Yeah, this next question, I'm not sure, it's pretty complicated and it's not even about the person, it's about their brother. I'm not sure you can answer, but it is from, I didn't say who it's from, but oh yeah, Elaine, she says her 82 year old brother suddenly cannot swallow. The ER diagnosis was sinus infection. He lost 17 pounds in 70 days, took him to the Mayo ER and he had nerve conduction tests. The diagnosis was dysphagia, brain not communicating with esophageal and windpipe flaps. He cannot even swallow his own saliva. He was sent home with a feeding tube. They ruled out cancer and stroke. He could not do the barium test. The doctors are baffled. Wow. And that was from the Mayo Clinic, right? Yeah. So here's what I find these, um, these, these places. These are the ivory towers of medicine the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, where Dr. Esselstyn is, um, you know, Columbia Presbyterian, uh, Mass General, you know, Baylor, th these kinds of places, they're academic places. Um, they're excellent. There's no place better in the world to get a diagnosis. So humble little Dr. Weiss, if, if, if they could not, if they threw up their hands and couldn't tell you why this was, um, there may be little chance that I could help you. I'm sorry, I'm just being, I'm just being straight with you. Um, so, uh, because they're excellent. They, they may be conventional in their treatment, but they leave, they're very, very smart at trying to find out why something occurred. So. You know, it sounds like you have a very difficult neurologic problem and uh, they have the world's experts there at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. Um, you know, again, when I'm in a very difficult spot, the best, and I know Dr. Goldhammer likes, Dr. Goldhammer likes a tough, a tough challenge. So what do you have to lose? Call Dr. Goldhammer at the True North Clinic. Uh, whenever I find I'm stumped, the la my last resort is could be fasting. Try and try and pack the case by him. But if he can't swallow, how can he even drink water? Well, they put a tube into his stomach. Wow. 
if he's being fed by a tube. Something happened with his nervous connection. And apparently, from what she's saying, Mayo Clinic can't find out what it is. Yeah, that's rough. Sorry yeah, about it's, that. It's very serious. Okay, this is from Debbie. I'm 63. Postmenopausal since 45, been whole food plant based three and a half years. I have hypothyroidism for the past 40, but for the last year and a half, my T3 has been low, 52, and the normal range starts at 73. However, my TSH is normal. My white and red blonde count is low, but my iron is normal. Any suggestions? I'm sorry, what did she say her TSH is? Give, give uh, me the, TSH the last is, numbers again. She said her TSH is normal, but her T3 has been low, 52, yeah. where normal is 73. And what were the other numbers? The red blood cells? She, what she didn't those? say. She said her white and red blood count is low, but her iron is normal. She did not give exact numbers. Okay. Well, uh, so thyroid, the thyroid is the gland that regulates the burning of energy in your body. It does that by producing two chemical directors or hormones, T3 and T4. They're made out of iodine. That's why you need iodine. Um, so uh, conventional doctors kind of, they, they don't really pay attention to T3 so, so much as long as, you know, people seem to be okay. Um, when, you know, and when somebody has hypothyroidism, the conventional practice is to just supplement them with T4, to give them levothyroxine or Synthroid. That's the pharmaceutical, like synthetic T4 thyroid hormone. Uh, but sometimes when there are difficulties, uh, doctors will give, uh, also give them the T3. The reason why we generally start off giving the T4 is because we, as far as we know, the T4 will convert itself into T3. So you don't have to give both. It's some, there's an equilibrium. T3 changes into T4, T4 changes into T3, and they mix it up. So if you just give T4, it'll get there eventually to T3. However, apparently in this young lady, she, her T3 is low. So if she's having some kind of symptoms or some kind of clinical evidence of abnormality, I guess that um, it would not be a bad idea to also give her T3 as well as the T4. What's the downside of that? The downside is that now she has to take two pills instead of one. And the other thing is that, um, you know, it's, it's expensive. It, the cost is, is higher. Uh, some people will give armor thyroid, which is ground up pig thyroids from CAFOs. But I have, um, you know, ethical problems with doing that. And the other thing is that, um, you know, I, these animals that come from concentrated animal feeding operations, they're highly contaminated with all kinds of heavy metals, dioxins, carcinogens, because of the way they're treated and what they're fed. So why would someone want to take armor thyroid, like a direct desiccated piece of thyroid from these contaminated animals, if they're doing everything, eating beautiful plants and you know, trying to avoid cancer? It's something that is inconsistent with your method. So uh, if you have to take, yeah, I would go to your doctor and say, look, uh, my T3 is low. If I have this or this and blah, 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 and it needs to be corrected, you could take something called Cytomel in addition to your levothyroxine. Thanks. This question is from Diane, and she says, a urine sample showed microscopic hematuria, a cytoscopy was done 
and trigonitis was the diagnosis. Urologist wanted me to use an estrogen cream to treat. I was opposed to this treatment as I don't feel comfortable taking hormones. Boy, she should have showed, listened to the show today at nine o'clock because that's all she talked about. I'm 63 and postmenopausal. I'm not having any discomfort or noticeable symptoms. Doctor is insisting I do this treatment. Is it really necessary? Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, she doesn't say how long she's had. This is just the spot urine that she had. She doesn't say how long she's had the no. blood. So, you know, um, so this requires a discussion or contemplation of blood in the urine. When I was in medical school, um, Chef AJ, we were taught um, a mnemonic device to remember what the causes of blood in the urine are. So this lady has microscopic hematuria. She has such tiny amounts of blood that you can't see it with your eye. You can only see it on a microscope, but any amount of blood like that, is, even if it's small, is abnormal. You should not have blood in your urine, even tiny amounts. So the causes, get ready for this, the causes, of blood in the urine, you can remember by, by the following mnemonic, shit, S-H-I-T-T. -T. S means stones, kidney stones. H stands for hemolysis. Your blood cells are being destroyed in your body from some evil process, and the blood is leaking into your urine. I is infection, like a urinary tract infection can cause blood. T is tumors or cancer. And the last T is trauma. Those are the four general considerations. Like you got injured, like you fell down and you bruised your kidney and now it's bleeding into your urine. Those are the four common things. Um, in general, you know, um, hmm. you know, Estrogen withdrawal is not, is not on that list. However, you have to remember, not everything in the world is in a textbook or a mnemonic or whatever. And this is where the art of medicine comes in. So an excellent doctor, and this is where off-label uses of medicines come in. Like even though it wasn't uh, approved for this use, doctors can find it useful to do this in another way with a treatment. So um, we know that, um, I'm assuming, it sounds like the urologist, if you've gone to a workup where they did a cystoscopy, a cystoscopy is where a urologist puts a tube from the outside world in through your urethra and goes into your bladder and looks around. And apparently they found that the lining was a little inflamed. They didn't find cancer there because that's what they're looking for. I'm sure that they didn't find infection because they test for that. They didn't find the other parts of the S-H-I-T. -T. So now he's left with this. So um, if the urologist is, so let me back up a little bit. In postmenopausal women, I have not, I have not seen this personally. I've not had a problem with this in my postmenopausal woman as a cause for hemat hematuria. But uh, all of the tissues of the, of the lower general urinary tract can become atrophic or kind of, eh, kind of a, a poor quality. And so I think that's why they want to give you this trial. So my advice to be, and it, it's an empiric trial, which means that he wants to try it, see if it goes away, and if it goes away, Okay, good, <laughs> problem solved. Um, I think that you could do the following, especially because you're not, asymp you're not symptomatic. You don't wanna take the hormones, don't take them. I mean, the important things that could kill you, he ruled out, which is like a cancer or a tumor or trauma, or you bruise your kidney. He did his workup. All he saw is a little irritation. Most things in medicine, they will eventually resolve if you leave them alone. <laughs> Don't forget that. So uh, eat a whole food plant-based diet. Um, you know, make sure your diet is very clean. 
and go back and have your primary doctor recheck your urine in three months or six months. Make it six months. You don't have anything dangerous there. And even if it is a little irritated, that's, you know, it's not a danger to you. And get another urine. And if the urine is clean, nothing else to do. If it's still blood in the urine, you can re reconsider taking the local estrogens. And by the way, if you do have problems um, with painful intercourse or sexual dysfunction there, that the estrogens will help that too. Great. Thank you. Uh, the doctor today was very interesting talking about how doing that can actually prevent UTIs. So that's... Yes. The first thing, when I have a postmenopausal woman, but I'm assuming the doctor, she, they, she didn't have an UTI because they, they test for that. But the first thing I suspect when an older woman past menopause comes in with repeated, like more than one UTI, that they need estrogen down there. Yep. Right. This is from Dina and uh, she lives in Ontario, Canada. And she says that she's had blood work come back a few times normal, except for vitamin D and creatinine. Creatinine was at 1.8, but I guess the range is 2.5 to 20. Doctor, um, uh, but a pharmacist recommended she doubled vitamin D during the winter months because of where she lived. Uh, so is that a good idea? And uh, her vitamin D is currently at 46.6 and the range is 75 and to 250. So I guess she wants to know about vitamin D and creatinine. Well, creatinine is... Uh, yeah, she said, her he, she said her creatinine is 1.8, but the range should be 2.5 to 20. I don't know what... It, creatinine is, is a waste product. A protein waste product that floats around your blood that the kidney is supposed to strain, strain out and keep at a level of, let's say, below one or 1.1, somewhere in that range, 1.8 too high. So I think that she, she's not, there's something missing from her information. A, a kidney, a creatinine of 1.8 would be kidney failure or chronic kidney disease, or renal insufficiency, it would be meaning your kidney is, 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 um, is the function is not good. So some, that information is, I don't know what to do with it. Um, maybe she made a creatinine in her urine, but that, that's not the creatinine numbers that doctors usually, that range is, is not, she, I don't know. She said blood test, you know? Nope. It should be a creatinine of the blood should be less than one. 1. 1.8 too high. So she's saying the range is 2.5 to 20 and hers is 1.8. I don't know what she's referring to. Okay. So please write back because you'll come back yes. next month and we have a couple yeah. more questions that we'll say for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. Okay, Chef Adrian. All right. You take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back a bit earlier tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for Dr. Micah Yu and Dr. Melissa Mandala. They're going to be talking a lot about auto.